Now remember there are two sides within our nature, and that is the old man and the new man. And we've learned and we established that the old man is dead, and there are things that we can put off the old man and get victory against our former conversation, as Ephesians chapter 4 worded it, and we can put on the new man and gain daily victory. Daily victory. And how that's done, as I've shown you last time, it is done through a process of first putting it off, the old man, like getting rid of it. It's not letting it sit through spiritual activity. You can't just quote a memory verse, for example, while debating the sin in your mind. So you have to put away the sin first. When you put away the sin first, then what happens is this new man can be able to start operating, functioning, and gain victory. All right, we're going to look at Ephesians chapter 4, verse 28. Let him that stole steal no more. So if people have a habit of stealing in their flesh, the Bible says steal no more. So notice that you have to first get rid of stealing. So that follows the pattern that you've learned in last Ephesians study, remember? It would go from verse 22, 23. You first put off the old thing. Right. So you first do that. So let him that stole steal no more. But you can't just stop cold turkey. You say that I'm going to stop drinking. Well, it doesn't work that way. You have to replace it with something else. So the spiritual activity must be practiced. That's why you have to go to church. I keep stressing that. You have to read your Bible. You have to pray. You have to memorize verses by quoting scripture, etc., etc. You have to do these things so that you can have something replacing the old man's activity. Amen. Look at the next part, but rather let him labor. So notice that your body's saying, well, I want to steal, but then you replace that with working in an honest job. When you work in an, uh, rather let him labor, working with his hands, the thing which is good. So you're working in an honest job, you're laboring with your own hands, that way it can get rid of the old side of stealing. Now it says the thing which is good, so notice I said honest job, right? So working in a liquor store, that is not an honest type of job that is good as a testimony as a Christian. Uh, making your living playing poker or gambling as a pit boss, that's not an honest job, that's not a good testimony. Some of you used to do things in the worldly life, in the lost life, where it was not a good testimony as a Christian, and as much as some of you might want to go back to those old worldly things again, you know, this is not right for me as a Christian, so I'm just gonna have to trust in God. Some of you have to change your entire profession and career, still searching for work. A few of our members are like that. And you can't go back to the old past anymore. Right. But that's a matter of trusting in God and Amen. living in an honest job. Amen. The worst thing you can do is, uh, worse than going back to the worldly position, is that you go into stealing, which I hope will not be the case in your life. Keep reading. That he may have to give to him that needeth. So, that he may have. So then by working an honest job, he may gain something, earn some living, to give to him that need it. So that he can give to other people who are in need. Now, notice that's a total contrast from the beginning of verse 28. At the beginning of verse 28, this man was stealing, stealing. All it was was about him, him, and him. But now instead of stealing for himself, he's now giving it away to others. There's a huge difference between the old man and the new man. One of the best ways to gain victory over your flesh and do something spiritual is do always the opposite. For example, you think of a depressing thought, oh, I'm so alone. Then the best thing is to replace it with the opposite, something spiritual. Go to church. It's that simple. 
Get rid of that depressing thought of loneliness by going to church and surrounding yourself with people. Amen. All right, let's look at the next passage. Notice that the verse says, let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth. So out of your mouth, there should be no corrupt language, corrupt communication that proceeds. That's why we don't talk the same old language like we did before. A lot of you, when you first came to our church, it was hard for some of you to quit cussing. But the Lord gave you victory against that. But that which is good to the use of edifying. So notice that the Bible says, now you replace the corrupt communication with something that is good. So now the dirty language replaces, is replaced with positive communication, edification. So notice that the passage says that you want to talk in a way that edifies, benefits, encourages other people. But that which is good to the use of edifying, it's used to edify other people. It is important to use your mouth in that sense. That it may minister grace unto the hearers. So that it can minister, it can serve as giving grace to people. A lot of times you have to be careful with how you talk. You want to think about how you can talk in a way that gives grace to others. Amen. Now that's very important to understand is that in language, that's the total opposite from dirty language. Dirty language, filthy language, language that hurts other people, that harms other people. And that replaces with edifying other that gives grace to them. That the important thing that you should be doing as a Christian is always looking at your communication and see if it gives grace to other people. Amen. It gives grace to other people. So sometimes, here's an example, sometimes Bible believers have a heady, heady weight of knowledge. And with all that knowledge, imagine that some newcomer comes into church and then you just poured out all of this at once to the person then think about it. Will it give grace to the person? It's not necessarily saying that you're doing something sinful and wrong. It's all spiritual. But you're not going to edify the other person by talking about all sorts of doctrines that the person is way over their head or cannot understand. Right. Right. You have to think about what gives grace to the person. Right. That's right, right. Look, the way that I talk to Brother Sean is very different to how I talk to Sister Juanita. And the way that I talk to Sister Juanita is very different from how I talk to Brother Max. Why? Because I don't talk about guy things with a sister in Christ. <laughs> Even if it's spiritual. I don't talk about Sean's crazy theories with Sister Juanita. I'd be a stumbling block. No, brother, that's not something to rejoice about. <laughs> So you have to think about what gives grace to the other person. Right. A great example is this. I remember that at the beginning, when we were starting out as a church, we started out as a group of believers that was Korean. It was solely Korean to begin with. So then, when we started out as a Korean church, the first white person that came to our church was Brother Chuck. Brother Chuck, he is a huge blessing. However, he is not your typical type of person. Some of you are my witnesses on that one, if you know Brother Chuck. Brother Chuck, I mean, this is a guy that doesn't, uh, that's not quiet. This is a man who talks a lot. And he is very, very loud, especially during service. So then he'll go, ooh, ah, and then all of a sudden he'll go, amen, 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 and then slam the table, and then some of the people using the table, they're like, oh. now the Korean people, they're like in shock mode that they get totally scared out of their wits. Wow. So at the beginning, it was very tense as a church, because I can't say the Korean people were wrong, or Brother Chuck was wrong. They both were very spiritual people in their own spiritual way. Korean people, uh, they, don't, uh, they don't act very uh, lighthearted. They're actually very serious when it comes to church, very austere. That's how they worship God. They take things seriously because they take honor, respect very seriously. 
compared to the American culture, it's totally different. So, I mean, now it's gotten to a point where you're disrespecting people now, so which is not good. Now, I don't know about some of you, but uh, we refer to each other by a first name, and I understand that because of that closeliness and that fellowship. But to me, honestly, uh, before I became pastor, I wouldn't dare call you by your first name. I see that as very, very rude. I would call you Mr. or Mrs. something out of respect. I wouldn't actually say, hey, Sheila, what's up? I, I wouldn't do that. That is totally disrespectful. But when I became a pastor, you know, by calling people by their last names, some of, them would, some of the Americans would say, I feel old when you say that. <laughs> or it just sounded uh, kind of weird because I'm the pastor, I'm their leader. So it was pretty hard for me to change uh, myself a little bit. But it was the same thing with the Korean members and Brother Chuck. So this is important that I want you all to hear. As a Bible-believing church, when you're talking, you have to think about, does it give grace to them? So, Brother, uh, when I talked to uh, the Korean people, they understood that, hey, so, look, this is how uh, Brother Chuck is. He just loves people. It's just, it's not that, you know, he's being loud and inconsiderate. It's just that he really loves God. He really loves people. He has such a great passion for Jesus Christ. Amen. And maybe more than some of you, but I didn't say it that way, you know. <laughs> but that's probably his character is that he just loves God. And then I told Brother Chuck that, hey, you know, uh, this is how the Korean culture is like. And you, you got to try to think about others, you know. Can't just think about yourself. I know that you love Jesus Christ and you want to uh, give him all the glory. But sometimes you have to think, think about that if you really love God, you'd love his children too. That's good. So then by doing that, Brother Chuck, Chuck, he didn't like really shout as loud, Amen, Amen, and then bang the floor and then scared people in the middle of church service. But what was kind of even a little bit more embarrassing was onliners. So onliners, they can, I don't know if you guys know this, but they can hear the, uh, they can hear the shouts at the background. So when you say Amen, Glory to God, stuff like that, they can hear that. But then they can't focus on the message because of that noise. <laughs> So that happens at times. So then, does that mean uh, don't say amen? No. Uh, say amen, glorify God, but think about others at the same time. Right. So when you think about others at the same time, it's not asking Chuck to change his whole character. Chuck just toned it down a bit more. Mm, that's good. By toning it down a bit more, you know, he lowered his volume of his voice a little lower. Uh, amens, he just said it a fewer times. He didn't really bang the table anymore unless uh, he knows he's very close to a person and he knows a person will be uh, getting along with him. And then he was like more respectful. He was more respectful. And then uh, after that, the Korean people, they got even more close with Chuck. And they're like saying, because uh, Chuck would hug everybody. And then the Korean uh, ladies, they're like, whoa, what's this? But now that he didn't uh, like hug them because he's trying to be considerate of them, the Korean ladies are like, Chuck, where's my hug? And Chuck was shocked. He's like, oh, and then he just hugged that. So then we got along great as a church. Why? Because, again, you got to realize this. It's loving each other. So when you love each other, when you think about others, you got to think about how you administer grace to the people. All right? So sometimes when you're too serious, you're too quiet, and you don't talk to other people, they think that uh, you don't like them. So you have to think about that. If you shout really loud or talk really loud, especially during meetings, sometimes it can disrupt the concentration of people. So think about that. And what it's not changing who you are. You will always be who you are. That's the beauty of you. But it's more polishing you, make, uh, making you a more better who, who you are. Imagine a passion that's more controlled for others. That can be a powerful asset. Imagine a seriousness and austereness that's more in control to edify other people. That becomes even more powerful. Does that make any sense? Yep. So uh, remember, when you talk to other people, when there's a communication, think about how it can administer grace to the hearers. That's especially hard for some zealous Bible believers. So that's very important to understand because they just go off the gun and they know so much Bible and then they just bash every uh, wrong religion and wrong doctrine and then when they first soul win, it's not like uh, that they use wisdom. It's more like you're going to burn in hell if you don't receive Christ for your salvation. 
Why? Because they just go off the gun and there's no wisdom. Why? Because there's so much zeal, zeal for the Lord. So it's, it's spiritual communication that you're doing, but you have to think about, does it edify other people? That's extremely important to understand. So remember that, church. Remember that. Because what edifies Brother Sean, what I say to him, will not edify you. And what edifies Sister Juanita will not edify Sister Sheila. Yeah. What I say to Sister Juanita that edifies her, it won't edify Sister Sheila. So it's so important to understand that you have to remember the way that you talk. Sometimes, especially onlineers, be careful with what you watch online. You're, you make up your own form of uh, what, everything that you watch. And then what happens is, especially during this uh, time where everyone's angry <laughs> with what's going on, I'm not happy with where our country is at, but then do you think that the other person who did not watch the news at all and did not want to know what's going on because uh, it just makes them angry, that you'll edify them when you tell them about everything that made you angry on what's going on at Capitol Hill and politics and all that kind of stuff. See that? Especially online is not really trustworthy nowadays, too. Some of the information that you see online or in mainstream news, a lot of it's stuff when you combine it together, then you're going to talk about stuff that you saw, you studied, you watched, and yeah, it may edify you and you learned a lot, but it won't edify other people. So remember that. Amen. I mean, you think that what I learned from uh, my counseling psychology class will edify you guys? It will be a blessing to you if I throw some of these psychological terms and concepts to you? No. You know what your impression to me is? Who do you think you are, you smart aleck? I don't care about that. <laughs> so remember, think about how uh, the other person, what they're like, what edifies them. Right. That's it. All right. Let's go to back to Ephesians chapter 4. So we understand that corrupt communication cannot come out of your mouth. And you got to think about what edifies other and ministers grace to the hearers. Amen. Now this passage is often used, it is quite often used against some Bible-believing preachers who may not use such pretty language, let's say. Now I don't know if you knew this, but in your Bible... There are people who actually used harsh language. And some of them, you would get to the point that's like really crude and rude. And then you might go, oh, he must not be a Christian by doing it that way. No, actually, you'd be surprised. The Holy Spirit can be behind those words, despite of how hard the language might be. It might be, it might be uh, coarse. It might be rude speech. But the Lord can use that. You might say, really, there are some examples? Yeah. Uh, Paul is one great example where he says that his lady, uh, not his lady, his letters, his letters are known to be very weighty and that his speech is very, uh, it is contemptible. Now, if you look up that word, that is actually rude, that is harsh, and some of it can be a, a little bit crude sometimes, a little bit, if you look at some definitions. You might go, really? Yeah, he mentioned about dung before. Mm -hmm. Try to update that in your modern language, which I wouldn't dare say. Right. Nehemiah, you know what he did? He cursed at the people who weren't doing things right in his church. What a pastor, right? Well, he did worse than that. He plucked off some of their be beards and spat on them and beat them. Wow, wow what a godly pastor. What's <laughs> you know what? Uh, you wouldn't dare poke fun at some Catholics who are probably torturing themselves. Some of them actually crucify themselves on crosses, which is totally sad. You wouldn't dare watch that and go, ha ha, like that. Then we think you're an evil person. But Elijah did. The prophets of Baal were cutting themselves with lancets and knives, and Elijah was laughing at them. Where's your God? He's probably out on a vacation. What in the world? I mean... Look, uh, that totally contradicts what you read here about let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth, but that which is good to the use of edifying. Now, I'm not hard like some of these people, but some people, especially onliners, now this is something that you got to get inside your heads, is that onliners, you're living in a day and age where you think that because you are s so sensitive and became snowflaked by what the news media and by 
uh, political correctness, and etc., cetera, etc., cetera, all that kind of stuff. You're so influenced by that nowadays that you think that when I preach and rebuke and act sarcastically and criticize some preachers who should know better and who are responsible for people's soul, you say, oh, Pastor Kim, you got to start using grace conversation why are you so mean why are you so rude but if you look at this passage at verse 29 this is the key okay there are times you should use sarcasm if you now listen up now this is important if you use your mouth that always gives grace to the people 24 7 you're not right with God did you hear what I just said that might be shocking to some of you, but you're not right with God if you always talk in a way that gives grace to the person you might say how so there are times you should give grace to a child when they act uh, because a child is very hard to uh, raise. So there are times you have to be understanding, loving, patient, but you can't just keep giving grace to that child all the time either. Right. You have to put your foot down and say, that's enough. Mm -hmm. You have to use anger. Right. You have to show them that you're serious, especially if your kids messes up and then uh, commits some kind of uh, misdemeanor or some kind of uh, citation, etc., going off and party out in the middle of the night, especially if it's your daughter out with a bunch of single guys. I mean, if you, I mean, you can't administer grace to her that time. You should be angry, and she should be scared. Mm. Now, I don't know if that's hard for some of you, but if that's hard for some of you, you got so sensitized, you became such of a snowflake generation. Mm. You better walk. I mean, this is we live in that kind of a day and age. Didn't you know that the book of Proverbs, it says to use uh, anger and then it can actually drive away some of the bad stuff? It did say that. Proverbs condemns anger. There are verses in Proverbs that condemns anger. But there is a verse in Proverbs that says to use anger so that it can be like a wind that can uh, blow away the opposition or the problem. You might say, what's the point here? No, this is the point. The point is... Don't use, verse 29, corrupt communication. That Don't let it uh, proceed out of your mouth. Why? What's the purpose? But that which is good to the use of what? Edifying that it may what? Minister grace unto the hearers. That's the key. The key in this passage at verse 29 is when you use edifying conversation, the purpose is, is that it's administering grace to the hearers. Well, hey, guess what? Elijah is not administering grace to the Baal prophets. No, he's going to cut off their heads because that's what God commanded. God said no mercies to those Baalite prophets. That wasn't a time for him to administer grace to the Baalite prophets. Let me tell you something. Jesus Christ, thank God for his grace on the act of Calvary. But if he went like that 24-7 and he made sure that, oh, I'm always gracious. I'm not. And then a, a person died in his sins scoffing mocking at jesus christ especially at this wicked day and age mocking at his grace at his mercy they went to heaven you think that jesus should show them grace oh come inside my heaven no he has to administer proper wrath yeah. so what's the point here the point is is that people don't understand there's a time and a place to administer grace mm -hmm. and a time and a place where you should speak very harsh amen I mean, everyone is now in this one-minded, I don't want to go off on this because I'm actually, I'm, I'm stuck at this verse for some weird reason, but what makes me extremely angry is we're living in a day and age that I dare say all of us, all of you have been influenced in some way to think in some kind of uh, conversation and to talk in a way of political correctness because of what you were raised in schools what you saw on TV. Okay. Now back to the point at hand. Verse 30, all right? Verse 30. And grieve not the Holy Spirit of God. So a lot of times we grieve God the Holy Spirit with our sins, right? We let him down. We're not supposed to do that. Whereby ye are sealed unto the day of redemption. Now that's important. You are all sealed... All the way till the rapture. Amen. So the rapture, no matter how many times you are wicked in your sin or in your iniquity, the Bible says that 
despite of how much you may have let God down with your wicked sins and grieved Him, the Holy Spirit is sealed. It is sealed unto the day of redemption. So what's the day of redemption? The day of redemption, if you might recall, is referring to the rapture. Now, I'm not going to show you those verses. I showed it to you at Ephesians chapter 1 before. At Ephesians chapter 1, and you compare that with Romans chapter 8, it would show you that the day of redemption is referring to the rapture. So, the Holy Spirit is sealed till the rapture. So then some people get worried. Oh man, what if I miss out the rapture? Look, if you receive Christ for your salvation, you can't miss out the rapture. A lot of people are panicking and they're like wondering, well, what do I have to clean up and what do I have to do? No, look, if you receive Christ for your salvation, you're raptured, period. No matter what. No matter how many times you grieve the Holy Spirit of God. That verse is powerful. Powerful verse for eternal security. So it's once saved, always saved, no matter how many times you grieve God with your sins, and you are sealed. It says sealed. And the seal cannot be broken. When can it go? All the way. What's the limitation? All the way to the rapture. See? So impossible. Impossible. It's all the way till the rapture. So this is a strong verse that is against the... the man, it is such a plague now online. This is really bad. I think people are taking advantage of uh, the COVID situation. Where people are fearing the mark of the beast and the antichrist. And there are onlineers taking advantage of that, trying to make people see that, see, so you cannot sin, you cannot comply, you cannot do this or that or that, because your salvation is dependent upon it. You don't want to lose your soul to the Antichrist or to the tribulation. We got to resist and fight, and that attracts those type of people, especially people who are into conspiracy theories and angry against the Antichrist government system. That's why they deny a pre-tribulation rapture, and they deny the doctrine of once saved, always saved. Right. But it is important to understand, I mean, you know what your sin you're committing is? It's pretty much pride. Mm -hmm. Because you think that, oh, so then as long as you're in my level of spirituality, then you're saved. And you know you got your sinful issues you're struggling with, but you think that, oh, no, but overall I'm living for Jesus Christ. How do you know? Do you know deep down inside the depths of your heart and your imagination how often you might commit more sin than good probably? Yeah. Thought about that? And up to what point do you think it's really good compared to uh, your sinful life? What's the limitation? There's no boundary line there. So then it comes down to see a matter of pride then. Unless you're living for God like me, then you're saved. Then that becomes a stumbling block to other brethren. And then uh, there might be awful fights in the church after that, unless you're spiritual like me, because then you don't realize how capable you are as a sinner. Right. If you always think of yourself as a dirty, rotten sinner, like Paul said, I am the chief of sinners. If you always think yourself that way, then humility is built up and your holy life is built up even better. Compared to thinking that I'm already holy enough, good enough, so because of that, I am going to heaven. Got to watch out for that attitude. Got to watch out for that attitude. It is very dangerous. We're going to look at verse 31. Verse 31. Let all bitterness... Okay, now this is an important verse. All of this is in line together. What? Let all bitterness and wrath... So bitterness goes along with... Wrath. Did you see that? When you get angry, you don't get angry unless there's bitterness in you. Right. And when you're bitter against somebody, it's impossible to do that without getting angry. Wrath. Right. They're, they're all in line together. And anger. So anger follows along with wrath as well. You cannot help yourself but be so upset. The next part is and clamor. Mm -hmm. So notice that some of you might not know this, but clamor is referring to basically all this kind of gossip, oh. all this kind of clamor, spreading rumors, right. news, right. information. I mean, that is especially bad in churches. Amen. Amen. You got to watch out for that kind of stuff. That is infamous uh, in both American and Korean churches I've been to. It is 
awful. Yeah. So awful. Yeah. You guys act so spiritual here, but then behind closed doors, you just oh. go like this about other people. That is so bad. You got to stop that. But clamor happens. Amen, brother. It is impossible to escape bitterness, wrath, and anger when there's clamor. Remember that. When the clamor happens within the church, guess what? Bitterness is eventually going to rear its ugly head right. or wrath right. or anger. Yeah. You got to watch out for that. Notice in the same uh, context of the verse, and evil speaking. Look at that. It's not just spreading rumors, but now you speak evil of the person. Right, right. So then pastor hurt your feelings and then you mention to another person what the pastor did wrong. So a member did something at the church and then you mention to another person member what the other member did wrong see that's evil speaking mm -hmm. when you speak evil guess what there will be bitterness someday that will develop in the church and wrath and anger so God sees all of that together and says be put away from you that is so important so bitterness are you bitter against somebody no I'm not all right then wrath do you have wrath issues well, I don't know about that. Not really. And anger. Do you sometimes lose your anger? Well, guess what? There's someone in your life that I bet you developed bitterness because of that yep. from what you did. You might fix bitterness and wrath, but because of your anger that time, you may have to develop somebody's bitterness. See, they're all in context together. And clamor. Was there clamor going around? And evil speaking. Did you speak evil about somebody? Then wrath, somebody over here is going to have wrath because of your evil speaking. And somebody over here is going to have bitterness because of your evil speaking. And then Satan successfully breaks the church apart. Because if the world speaks evil of them, the church will still stay strong. So then he'll say, I'll have a saved Christian speak evil of them. And then guess what? The church falls apart. Did you hear what I just said? When the world speaks evil of you, uh, you just let it brush off your shoulders and the church stands strong. But when a saved brother in Christ within your church speaks evil of you, guess what? The church falls apart. Now, this is important at the last part of verse 31. You have to put all that away from you. Why? It's with all what? Malice. Ah, isn't that interesting? Now, look, the church is built upon a strong foundation. But the problem is that Satan... Tears it apart one by one. Somebody gets bitter. And when there's bitterness, there's going to be wrath somewhere. Or if there's wrath somewhere, then there's going to be anger somewhere. Or if there's anger somewhere, then there's going to be clamor somewhere. And once there's clamor somewhere, then there's going to be evil speaking somewhere. But all of this, now remember this. This is what you're not using your heads, okay? No matter how much you might justify any of these motions... God does not see it as something, as a good excuse. He sees all of that as what? Malice. It says with all malice. And he says all. So a lot of times you have to check your heart. Is there evil in your heart? That's what malice is. Malice is it intends evil. It intends evil. That's dangerous. That's dangerous. It intends evil. So you have to realize when you look at your heart that, oh my goodness, I'm actually intending evil where it can hurt the church, even though you don't think that you are, you don't mean to. But God sees it that, that way. God sees it that way. It's with all evil intention. So you have to be careful of that mouth. Now, I, I spoke a lot against the mouth today. Okay, let's look at verse 32. Amen. Amen. And be kind one to another. Now, notice that. Verse 31, this is the issue. This is all flesh. This is all old man. Now, you're going to have to replace that. Remember? This is all old man. All this. So, if you put that away from you, you got to replace it with something else, right? The replacement is be kind one to another. So now from this spiritual nature, there should be kindness. Are you kind to people? So keep being kind to each other. What helps you diminish that anger toward another person is start being kind to them. 
If you act kind, that anger is going to diminish more. Amen. Tender hearted. So notice that your heart is supposed to be tender toward the person. See, this is all wrath and bitterness. So it's developing a hard heart. But God says, no, be tender hearted. Usually tender hearted people, you know what they do? A lot of times tender hearted people will be considerate of the other person and not how they feel. Right, right, right. That's tender hearted people. You ever met a tender hearted person before? It's usually a person who always thinks about you, considerate about you, does something loving to you. And then you'll say, that person has a tender soul. When I get angry at the person, person doesn't get angry back. Tender hearted. And then we'll talk, call those people tender hearted. Forgiving one another. Ah, that's what gets rid of bitterness. That's what gets rid of the clamor. You know what stops clamor immediately? It's when you forgive the other person. Amen. It's when you Amen. forgive the other person and you say, look, I forgive you underneath the blood of Jesus Christ. Amen. You know what I do? Even, even if a person... Uh, even if a person gets upset at me and does not forgive me, guess what? I forgive them. Amen. Sometimes if I say that I forgive you to the person, it even makes them more angry because they're like thinking, oh, so you're saying I'm in the wrong and you forgive me. So then you know what I do? I don't even say I forgive them. I just say, I forgive you in my heart. The Lord got it under the blood. Amen. One person in the church actually apologized to me and you know what I did? I stopped that person short and I told that person, it's all covered under the blood. I, under the blood. I, I did yes. that weeks under. I did that weeks ago. Amen. I did that weeks ago, church member. So don't worry about that. Just keep coming to church. The church Amen. member said, "Thank you, pastor." That's it. Amen, pastor. I did that weeks ago before the apology. The next one, even as God for Christ's sake hath forgiven you. Yes. Ah, Amen. everyone hates that. Everyone hates that. If there's a passage that the NIV should chop off, it's that. Uh, it's probably gone. <laughs> it is probably gone. You never know. It is so important that uh, that is my only reason why I can forgive you. Did you hear what I just said? Yeah. So the only reason why I can forgive you and helps me so immensely is when I see how much I let Jesus Christ down and how much Jesus Christ has forgiven me. And when I look at how much Jesus Christ shed His precious blood at the cross of Calvary, and every time I always sinned and let Him down, then I go, look, as much as Jesus Christ can forgive me probably ten times a day, why can't I forgive that person this one time? Amen. And then even if that same person commits the same problem, in the church in the future, why can't I forgive that person Amen. again? It is so important that you have to have forgiveness, kind-heartedness, tender-heartedness, and what helps you immensely, especially, listen up now, especially when you're in charge of a ministry, you definitely need that. Amen. Because sheep are sheep, and sometimes it can frustrate you. I guarantee you this, if you don't learn that now, you will when you get a child, when you have a baby, then you'll learn what it's like to be kind, tender-hearted, forgiving. Yep. That baby, you're going to forgive that baby waking you up through sleepless nights. Why? Because there's a kindness and a tender heart toward that baby and an understanding about the fragile state of the baby. And you have to think that way about other people. Okay. But the problem with us is that we think that, oh, we're all such spiritual Bible believers, so you should know better. No, trust me, they don't know better. That's right. yes. And guess what? This pastor don't know any better either. If you think that, look, I am just a sinner, but only becoming a pastor because of God putting me here, if you think that way, then you can press on for Jesus Christ. And you have to think that way about each other too. And the best way to do that is thinking about Jesus Christ, how much he's done for you. Because if you feel like you should be harder on the other person, then the fair share is God should be harder on you. Oh. Yeah. And trust me, He will. Oh. You know why some of you still have a problem with that, uh, uh, with the other person with any of these issues? You know why? You, uh, if you still have a problem with some of these, maybe that's why the Lord's still trying to be a little hard on you. Okay. You know why the Lord's kind of still being hard on you? Because you're still hard on the other person. Mm -hmm. And He's trying to make you go soft. Are you soft yet, child? No, not yet. Then I have to keep pressing you down. Thank you, Lord. All right. Thank you, Lord. I'll tell you what. You know what? Uh, finally, uh, I really believe this. 
What finally blessed me with much fruit in the ministry was when the Lord did this to me. And I thought I forgave the person. I thought I was tenderhearted and kind toward the person. But then the Lord says, now nah, you need to see a little more. So then he kept doing this to me and I saw more and more and more. And finally, when I reached at a point, like all the way down here, and the Lord said, okay, now I think it's the right time. And then he gave the fruit. Thank you, Lord. All right, let's look at chapter 5. Chapter 5. And then uh, we'll read verse 1. Be ye therefore followers of God as dear children. Now, God says that, therefore, what you should do, I mean, he gave you all these rules. Stay away from sin and do the spiritual thing. All these things, that's why you should follow God. That's what God would do. I mean, look at the previous verse, verse 32. Why should you forgive the other person? Cast away bitterness. Because uh, the reason why is Christ did it for you. So you're supposed to follow God. Now, are you a Christian? You are a Christian, yes? All right, then don't be a hypocrite and a liar. Christian means Christ follower. Christ forgave another person. You should too. Amen. Christ was kind to another person. You should too. Amen. And... Uh, all the other sins. I mean, let's not get stuck at verse 31, 32. Corrupt communication. Language that doesn't edify other people. Uh, stealing. Uh, verse 26, anger issues. Verse 25, lying. And uh, all sorts of sins during your lost, unsaved life. Following the context of verses 17 through 21. So all of that is to follow Jesus Christ. Now... If you follow Jesus Christ and you keep looking at Jesus Christ and you don't keep looking at this guy, your flesh, yourself, you're always full of yourself. <laughs> you got to get away from this guy. It's an X mark and you got to look at this person, the author and finisher of your faith. When you look at the Lord Jesus Christ and follow him, what helps immensely is that if you're a dear child, as dear, look, that verse says, as dear children. A lot of problems, the reason why I realize that grown adults are more hard to lead to salvation than children. You know why? Grown adults already settled in their own minds, their own ways, their own independence. But children are very dependent people. Children realize their helpless state. They, when there's an authoritative figure, they do yield and they comply into but see, you're too proud. You're too much of a proud American inside this culture. And because of that, that's the reason why that you have a hard time following Jesus Christ. But if you're a dear child, you know what children do? They imitate the person they admire, they look up to. Are you a dear child? Are you, dear, are you a dear child at heart? Or is there that grown adult pride in there? You know what I always do? Before I preach, before I teach, I treat myself as a child saying, God, I cannot teach a single thing right. I cannot preach a single sermon right. I'm like a little child. You need to help me. And God uses those people. That's humility. But people that says, oh, I can preach this message. I can do well. And they do that out of pride and spite. Then the Lord's not going to bless that. They fall quick. And they fall hard, and I've seen it. I've seen it. Look, I know that Hiles and Jack Scott, the Lord mildly used them, but guess what? Their ministry, their church fell down hard because they have a pride issue. Yeah. They, they had a really bad pride issue. Yeah. So that's why you got to be careful of that. You have to be a dear child at heart. But see, it's because you're not a dear child at heart, that's why there's all this uh, bitterness, clamor, anger within the church. That's why there's all that selfishness in the flesh at the, co at the previous chapter, all of chapter 4. You have to be a dear child at heart, and then you'll follow God. Now notice that verse 1, it says followers. Now in some Bibles and some translations, they're going to say imitators, not followers. Why is that important, Pastor? Because an imitator means something that's a counterfeit or something that's fake. Now, look, we are not imitators of Jesus Christ putting on a counterfeit fake display. We have to follow every step to the letter how Jesus Christ would do it in truth. Not something that's lie and fake. 
So imitators would imply something sinful and wrong. You, that it's fake. So then you know what modern Bibles are when they say imitators? They're fake news. That's what they are. So you cannot follow this kind of fake lifestyle or follow the fake news that you read in your lap. You got to read that precious word of God, the King James Bible, and then follow Jesus Christ. Now, look at verse 2. And walk in love. So when you're following Jesus Christ, you have to, because uh, when you're following him, Jesus Christ is going this way, you have to follow him. So that shows you have to walk. You have to walk and follow along his footsteps. And you gotta, your Christian walk has to be in love, obviously, in love. Remember, that is a foundation of chapter one, two, and three. That is so important. And I don't care if you justify your sarcasm your anger in the ministry and pointing out wrong doctrine and false prophets. Sure, the Lord might use it, and yeah, it might be right, but if you have no love in your Christian walk, then you are not right with God. I know that's purely a flesh. That is purely a flesh. There has to be a... It, the foundation of everything has to be love. It has to be love to begin with when you walk in uh, the Christian life. As Christ also hath loved us, so as much as Jesus Christ loved you, you're supposed to live in that sort of love. So guess what? You're not lo we're not a loving church where, like we're supposed to yet. You know that? Because Jesus Christ loved you more than you loved me or you loved other people in the church. <laughs> so you have to, we have to work on our love a little more. And hath given himself for us an offering and a sacrifice to God. Jesus Christ gave himself for our sakes as an offering and a sacrifice to God himself for a sweet-smelling savor. We know that Jesus Christ, by his sacrifice and offering, it became a sweet-smelling savor to God. God loves that smell of what Jesus Christ uh, did for him. And because his wrath was appeased and satisfied by the sacrifice of the Lord Jesus Christ, that's why we can go to heaven as a result. So that's the kind of love we should live like. This one. Always look at what Jesus Christ sacrificed and died to appease the wrath of the Father. And then you'll know if you really live in love like you're supposed to. The next part is, but fornication and all uncleanness or covetousness so there are three things that you want to note in this passage. Fornication, so that sex outside of marriage. The only exception is marriage, but any sexual relationship. And all uncleanness. So now it's talking about everything that's unclean, dirty, filthy, or covetousness. Now I find that interesting. Covetousness is in line with some of these uh, dark sins. Covetousness obviously means... Uh, wanting something that you don't have. Let it not once be named among you. Ah. So, Paul doesn't want the church to have a name that, hey, they could, there's fornication going on in the church. Yeah. There's all sorts of uncleanness going on, filthy stuff going on in the church. There's covetousness going on because they're stealing the offering plates and Wait a minute, this fits appropriately to our typical mega churches today. Uh -oh. And yes, even fundamentalist churches and some Bible-believing churches guilty. That's why there's always sex scandals, money scandals. Uh -huh. All kinds of stuff going on in the church. And that's why some people become bitter Christians or even atheists. Yeah. Because of what you did wrong in the church and you ought to be ashamed of yourself. That's why... Uh, it should not be named among you. But guess what? They got, it was named among them. Carl Lenz, Hillsong. Ravi Zacharias with his ministry recently. Got caught on that one recently. Daughter had to admit it. And then the website even confessed it. It was sad. And then um, there were other big name people. It was crazy uh, last month. There were a lot of big shot preachers. I'll give them out a little later on probably. But I was surprised. I was like, what in the world is going on? So a lot of the scandals are coming out with big name preachers, actually. So 
it should not be named among you as become a saints. Because you're God's child, you're a saint. So because you're a saint, it should not be named among you. So the lost world shouldn't see that in this church. Mm. All right, so then I'll close it here because verse 4, I might take a little long time. So verse 4 is pretty good. I'll explain what verse 4 means. And then it'll help you understand more about the importance of what should not be amongst our church. There is something in our church that you should not be doing. And Paul's going to explain it here. These are the typical sins that happen within the church that you should not be doing that is named. And Paul's going to give you some tips how to conquer it and what we can do to improve as a church. All right, so I hope that you uh, learn something, what you can do to, you know, a lot of this is actually something that we don't really like. The, the common core of today's lesson in Ephesians was about love, as we have seen. That's a whole pinnacle of that.